welcome to Webinar Wednesday here at Lulu. I hope that you are all having a fantastic day. I see that no one has started the chat yet, so who wants to be first? Don't be shy. Gold star for anyone who hops in first. So let us know where you're from, how your day is going. Oh, Michelle. Michelle is the first one. Yes. So, Michelle, we will get a recording. Great question to start everything off. So everyone who is registered today will receive a recording of today's webinar. We will also post it to our YouTube channel. Um, so if you have to hop out early um, or miss something or want to review the presentation, you will get a recording to your email as well as on our YouTube channel. Chocolate, hello. Always good to hear from you. Ricky, hello. Uh, Carrie Ann, good morning. And Roy, hello. So thank you all for joining us. Um, let us know what you're working on. Have you worked with micro influencers before? Uh, how did it go? What are you hoping to learn? So hopefully I can cover all those points and we will all walk away learning something that we did not know today. So hello to you all. Thank you so much for joining us. So if you are here, then you are here to learn about how to reach a wider audience by working with micro influencers. So that is the name of the game today. I'm going to walk, uh, walk you through um, what micro influencers are, how to work with one, and then give you some examples of Lulu working with micro influencers and kind of give you some things that were good. The good takeaways, the bad lessons learned. So hopefully as you embark on this micro influencer journey, you're better equipped for success. So, hey, everybody, thank you so much for hopping in the chat. Thank you for choosing to spend some time with me. And I'm going to go ahead and get started. All right. So if you do not know, you're with Lulu today. I am not Lulu. <laughs> Lulu is a company. It is also a, a word. It's a real word. So Lulu is a remarkable person, uh, object, or idea. We were founded in 2002 by Bob Young. Our publishing platform is free to use. We've published over 3 million books and paid out over $117 million in author revenue. That is so much money. And that number has only gone up since I've made this slide. So our mission is that we are dedicated to making the world a better place, one book at a time, through sustainable practices, innovative print-on-demand products, and a commitment to excellent service. If you come to any of our webinars, you know I always start out this way. I love letting people know that we are a B Corp. So Lulu is a B Corp. And B Corps, if you're not familiar, are for-profit companies certified by the nonprofit B Lab to meet standards of social and environmental performance, accountability, and transparency. So we go through this um, registration or uh, getting our um, certification for this. I think it's every two years. We basically just try to do our best for the planet and the people that we work with, the authors that we work for. Um, so I'm always really excited to let people know that we are a B Corp. The B Corp is a the B Corp community is a fantastic org, uh, group of companies that have decided to do good for the world and try to use their for profit companies for the betterment of this planet we all share. So the holidays are just around the corner. I read a newsletter today that said if you haven't started your holiday shopping, you're already late. A lot of people started their holiday shopping in May. I always tell myself as I'm scrambling on Christmas Eve to uh, check off my gift list that I'm going to start earlier. I never do it. But if you are in the at that point where you are looking for Christmas gifts or holiday gifts or, you know, whoever or however you want to celebrate, B Corps are a good way to go. All right. So I am Chelsea. I am Chelsea with Lulu. This is me and my cat. Uh, Batman will not be making an appearance today, unfortunately, um, but maybe one day we'll be able to get him to uh, to join us for one of these. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. All right. So today we are here to learn about micro influencers. What is a micro influencer? Why would you want to work with one? How you can pitch to a micro influencer if you find one that is a good fit for you and your brand. And then again, as I said, some examples that of Lulu, where we have recently within the past year, really started experimenting with this ourselves and just passing along some information that I think would be helpful to anyone who is kind of just starting out with this or interested in getting their, their feet wet, if you will, with working with influencers, either the micro or macro level. But today it's about the micro. So what is a micro influencer? So the internet will tell you that a micro influencer is someone with a social media following of 10,000 to 50,000 followers. Um, so basically, you're looking for someone who isn't huge, isn't enormous, but maybe more approachable for you and your brand. So these smaller uh, audiences are usually much more highly engaged than those of a larger, uh, a larger following. And I'm going to give you a, an example of that in our next slide. 
So micro influencers can span all niches, topics, and genres. So there isn't just one set, there isn't just one subsect that is claimed the influencer or the micro influencer. No matter what kind of interest you have, I'm sure that there is someone that you may look to for information, whether it be fitness or, um, you know, pet toys or, or um, you know, nutrition, um, home decor, gardening, um, disc golf, real golf, you know, whatever. There are people who are influencing in all of these spaces. So working with micro influencers can be a great way for you to really target your niche and reach them where you may not have otherwise. And because they have these smaller followings, it can feel more like a family and they're really having conversations and having discourse within this community that they've built. So that's why they're great candidates to work with to help grow your brand. So as I mentioned, they span all niches, topics, and genres. So if you are here today as an author and that is your main um, business or your main interest or hobby, then there are influencers for all of that. Every social media platform has booktubers, bookstagrammers, book talk. It's all a real thing, believe it or not. So there is an influencer out there for you if you are interested in working with one. So this last point I had on this slide, I wanted to mention that even those social media, so we're thinking about Instagram, uh, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, those are, you know, when you think about an influencer, those are a lot of the platforms that you think about immediately, but also you can find micro influencers in the podcaster space that have newsletters or blogs, and those can be really, really valuable as well. And I'll talk about that a bit later, but I want you to, as you begin thinking about this, Really, a micro influencer is anyone who has this, you know, ten to fifty thousand size audience. Obviously, it can be a bit less or a bit more. Who, uh, you know, is is curating content for that audience, making recommendations for that audience, or just having conversations with that audience about how to live better and more productive lives, or introducing things that they think their audience will enjoy. Okay, so why would you want to work with a micro influencer? So I touched on this a bit in our previous slide. But as I mentioned, followers are typically more engaged than that of macro influencers. So the example I'll give here, and I'm basing a lot of this off of a blog post that I wrote uh, for Lulu uh, based on the same title. And in that blog post, I gave the example of Amazon versus, you know, a, a smaller brand named Rothy's. So I was thinking about that example. And while I think it stands up, I think a better example is going to be this one that I'm going to share with you guys today. So you're getting the, the new and improved version of this blog post. So Think about Starbucks. Everybody knows Starbucks. There's a Starbucks on every corner. You know people that, that have Starbucks. They may have the cups or the mugs. You go there every day, whatever. That's fine. And surely there are people who really, really love Starbucks. But the majority of the people that follow Starbucks or engage with them aren't doing it because they love Starbucks so much. They're doing it because Starbucks is convenient. They're doing it because it's consistent. They know what their order is. They know what they're going to get by going into it and things like that. So that's one example of someone of a, a macro influencer, if you will. So Starbucks is the macro of coffees, right? It's like them and Dunkin' Donuts. They're everywhere all the time. They get a ton of visitors to their stores every day, every year. So compare those followers and fans to Sola Coffee, which is the example I'm giving. Sola Coffee is a coffee shop, an independent coffee shop in Raleigh. So that's where I am based out of. Um, Lulu is based at, or started in Raleigh, is in RTP now, which is right down the road. So Sola Coffee is something that several of our staff members really love. My boss loves Sola Coffee. He goes there every morning to get a coffee. He loves it. And not only that, but he talks about it all the time. So he brings his cup into work all the time. He's always talking about how great they are, how much he loves their coffee. He knows the owners. So that's an extra, an extra added layer of loyalty um, that we have there. And because of his love of Sola Coffee, We've been more involved with them than just a transaction. So they have events that we support um, coming up in September, which is tomorrow, <laughs> actually. Uh, they will have a 5K race where they will be raising money for ALS. This is something that has become very near and dear to Lulu. We've sponsored it, I think, for four years in a row. We put teams together that will run the race. We give them financial contributions. So that is just on top of several of us patronizing this store on a regular basis. So we talk about Solo because we love them because they're that small mom and pop shop we feel like is doing good in our community. We want to be a part of that. We want to support everything that they do outside of even selling coffee. So for Starbucks, you don't really see that fan loyalty. I mean, again, sure, there are definitely people who love Starbucks and they are committed to it. But the majority of the people who go to Starbucks are doing it because of convenience. There's really not that commitment there or that loyalty or that engagement of a solo coffee. So 
I give this example to kind of show you a real world um, reference for micro influencers versus macro influencers. So of course we all know the the Mr. Beast or the um yeah, I'm trying to think. Of course, I'm blanking. I should have probably written these down. But whoever huge influencers that we see online, you know, celebrities that have these online followings in the millions, LeBron James, I think he's like has the, the most of the millions, maybe, or Cristiano Ronaldo. Anyway, so there are people that have millions and millions of followers. However, working with them may not be as um, advantageous for you as you might think. Like when you just look at the numbers, you think, oh, working with this person who has four million followers, that's great. I'm going to get so much exposure. Maybe. I mean, that's definitely a lot of people that might look at your stuff. But the chances are when you get to that level, those people aren't checking your feed every day. They're not looking at these posts every day. They're not engaging with it on a regular basis. So that's something to keep in mind when we think about the power of micro influencers is, again, this Sola coffee example where the people that, you, that go to Sola they, that um, buy their coffee really champion that brand and the mission behind it and the folks that run it because you know them. There's a face to it, and it's a very personable exchange and interaction. So uh, another great thing about working with micro influencers is that it can be more affordable, which gives you a, a more of an opportunity to reach several new audiences and stay within your budget. So there are opportunities for you to work with micro influencers on an in-kind basis. So if you approach them and say, hey, I think that your audience would really love my book. I think that they're going to get a lot from it. I will give you five free copies to give away if you want to partner with me on this. I'll give you a free copy to read. If you like it, we can work on another collaboration. So it doesn't always have to be financial. You can obviously offer goods and services for free to the influencer as well. But there are also opportunities where they may say, hey, I will do a post about your product, service, or book. If you pay me you know, $200, $1,000, $1,500, it can go up from there. So because of this, if they have a smaller audience, usually a lot of these influencers will do paid campaigns or sponsored campaigns for a more reasonable fee. Because of that, you can kind of do your research, find a handful of micro influencers that may align with your brand and your values and kind of spread your budget out that way instead of saying, oh, hey, you know, I got this person to respond to me. They uh, said that they'll do some content about me for $5,000. They'll, they'll run an ad. And, you know, that's not an outrageous ask. I mean, you know, we see a lot of folks who who are asking that for ad placement. So, again, working on a smaller scale with influencers that align with your niche, your genre, the content that you're putting out, the audience that you want to reach can help you find maybe two or three different micro influencers who are willing to run sponsored ads or review your product or review your book rather than finding one macro influencer and spending your entire budget on something that may not really have much of a return for you. So another really good thing, a very appealing aspect of working with micro influencers. All right. And the last but not least, the thing I want to bring to your attention is for these smaller communities, every post matters. So, and you know, of course you can make that argument for people who have really large audiences that care a lot about the content they're putting out that that certainly um, is the fact or is the case for many larger influencers as well. But when you're just starting out, when you are on that micro influencer level, if you are trying to kind of gain more followers, then you have to have really highly curated and intentional content. You can't just be throwing stuff up there all willy nilly. You have to really think, is this going to help my audience? What are they coming to me for? Is this serving them? Is this helping them? And keeping the promise that I made in the beginning of you can come here for fill in the blank kind of content that's going to be consistent and high quality. So because of that, you can have access to these communities who really trust this influencer. So when you are working with a smaller community, they really feel like they know the person. And sometimes they have the opportunity to have conversations with them on a micro level. Maybe they, the influencer is able to look through all their all their content or all of their um, comments and respond. When someone follows them, follow that person back or reach out and send a note and say, hey, thank you for the sub. I appreciate it. What would you like to see from me? So when you have that level of person um, personability and communication in that relationship, and when this person puts a product, a brand, a service, or a book forward, their followers are much more likely to trust that recommendation because, again, they can't take the risk of putting something out that they don't believe in and they don't stand behind and lose those followers. I mean, when you have millions of followers, losing a thousand isn't that big of a deal. When you have 10,000 followers, losing a thousand can be a huge deal and a huge impact on the work that you put in to grow that audience. So working with micro influencers who have really built that sense of trust in their community and with their followers can help parlay some of that trust to you and your brand and their followers will see you in that same light, which again, 
gives them a higher, um, more of a reason to trust you, gives you a higher likelihood that they will trust you and engage with your content and whatever you're trying to share with this audience. Well, I also, I wanted to say this in the beginning, but we will save questions for the end. So I see that a lot of you have found the chat. Thank you so much for hopping in there. If you do have a question as we're going along, then you can drop that in the Q&A only tab if you'd like. Um, I will be looking at these at the end of our session and pulling up any questions that you have. So drop them in the Q&A tab if you have anything specific that you would like me to address. All right, so that is what a micro-influencer is. That is why you might wanna work with one, but how can you work with them? So I'm gonna give you some pro tips on what it looks like to work with a micro-influencer and how you may want to approach this and things you got, you, you'll want to know um, before kind of reaching that point where you, where you reach out to connect. All right, so again, if you have come to any of our webinars, if you have been in the Lulu sphere for any amount of time, if you've watched any of our YouTube videos, like and subscribe. But if you have, then you've heard us talk about knowing your audience and how important that is. So it doesn't matter if you have a trillion dollar influencer budget, if you don't know who you're trying to reach and who your book is for, who your product, who your service is for. So that's why it's just so important to, before you even start researching who you may want to work with, before you start reaching out, definitely, before you start kind of even thinking about what a budget might look like, what a campaign might look like, you need to know who your target audience is. So who are you trying to reach? So we talk about this all the time with authors and finding your ideal reader. Obviously, this goes for entrepreneurs, small business and content creators. Who is your content for? Who is your book going to help? So there is a great positioning statement you can use if you don't know who your target audience is. I believe that this is a we have a YouTube video called um, how to position your book. So if you aren't familiar with how to fill in a positioning statement or what that is, basically, it's a sentence that you fill in the blanks for that will help you find who your book is going to benefit and what that benefit to them is going to be. So that will help you narrow down who they are, who should be reading your book, who should be interacting with your brand, and who is going to get the most out of your content. So if you're not clear on who this is, start here. Figure out who, when you wrote that book, who do you know will love it? Who will be delighted in the content? Who is going to love your brand and get the most out of it? So Think about who that person is, and then you want to kind of follow that and say, okay, well, where would this person go? What what YouTube channels are they watching? What what websites are they visiting? What newsletters are they subscribed to? What podcasts are they listening to? What community events? What events? What concerts? You know, all of that. Where are they going and what are they doing? And then you want to see where that intersects with your content and your brand and how you can reach them. So that's always step one, right? Know your target audience or everything else would just be a waste of your time. So then, as I said, once you know your target audience and you find those people who they're going to to get their that information. So are there bookstagrammers that they're following? Is there a bookstagrammer in your genre uh, that a lot of folks that you want to reach are following? So find those people that are relevant to, so key, relevant to your brand, content, and genre. So just because you find a bookstagrammer on uh, on Instagram who has a, you know a million or 100,000 or 50,000 followers, just because they are under that hashtag of bookstagram, if you're writing a nonfiction self-help book and they you know, review YA romance novels or YA novels, that's not a good match. So you have to go a little bit deeper than that because making sure that you understand their audience and that it's the one you wanna get in front of is gonna be really, really helpful as you go to make your pitch. So yeah, again, do your research and understand their audience and the value they are providing so you can craft an appealing and mutually beneficial pitch. Well, past Chelsea really knew what I was going to be talking about here. And these, <laughs> these points are on point. Um, so yes, you want to know your audience and then you want to understand how they're interacting with their audience. So is the audience they built going to them for book recommendations? Are they going to them for self-help tips? Are they going to them for productivity? Are they going for, um, you know, hacks on fashion or makeup or, you know, skincare, whatever, whatever it is, just make sure that you understand that your audience and their audience intersect and that you're, and that you will be able to add value to their audience. All right. Another thing to know. So once you kind of have these first few down, know what your budget is before you reach out. So understand when you're going into it. So maybe, as I said, it doesn't always have to be a financial agreement. It can also be an in-kind donation, if you will. So if you say, okay, I, I know that I really want to get my book out in front of this person's audience, and I know that I have $500 to spend. 
understand your budget going into it. So you don't kind of get into a conversation and they're interested in working with you. And then they say, hey, my rate per post is $700, $800, $1,200. And then you're kind of, you, you know, you can't really go any farther with that because that's out of your budget. So if it is financial, understand what that number is. If it is an in-kind donation, say, hey, I'll give you 12 books. I'll give you, um, you know, a, a free book for you to review. And then we can do a giveaway together. I will give you a free coaching if that's what your, your business is or that's what you're trying to share. So you want to be able to add value for them as the influencer and then give their audience some value as well. So be really clear on what your offer is before you reach out and what you're comfortable doing. And, you know, you may start at 500 and if they come back and say, you know what, 700 is really what I'm looking for here. Be open to that opportunity and just kind of know what your what your limit is. Uh, next up is be flexible. So not only with the budget, but when you are reaching out to these folks, understand that they know their audience better than you do. So even though you did your research and you know what their interactions are like, they may have an idea. So you may come to them and say, hey, let's do a giveaway for five books. And they may say, OK, well, we could do that. Or what if we did a caption contest on this photo? And then, you know, I give one person this and we do this. So they may want to iterate on your original idea. And so just be open to that. I mean, them collaborating with you is the best case scenario because then they're offering their insight on what's really worked for them in the past and what they think their audience is going to like. So uh, one, collab one of our very first collaborations that we did was with a skateboarder, a professional skateboarder who published um, with Lulu. His name's Walker Ryan. And when I was kind of talking to him, and this is so new in our, I wish I could have watched this webinar before I did this because I was so new at working with micro influencers. And he has about 90,000 followers on Instagram, so a bit a bit larger. But, um, you know, I didn't really know what to ask or what to come to the table with. But I was excited because when I reached out to him, he suggested a really cool thing for him to do would be have a, a contest and let people guess how many books he can kickflip over <laughs> or ollie over or I, I don't skateboard. You, I don't know if you could tell that or not. But he knew what they were looking for and he knew what would be fun and engaging for them. And it was a success. I mean, it was really exciting. It was really cool. We had never done that before. And it was so neat to see him stack up all these books and then be able to jump over them on a skateboard, which is a really, really cool and engaging and out of the box idea for me. Um, so again, giving yourself that ability to have those conversations and leave room for flexibility can really create a, a really successful and exciting and fun collaboration that you may not be aware of kind of when you're going into it. So you also want to, before you pitch uh, to micro influencers, you also want to be really clear on what a successful campaign will look like for you. So when you go into it, I mean, there are so many things that you may be wanting to get out of this campaign. So you know, obviously, maybe you want to drive traffic to your website. Maybe you want to drive um, followers to your Instagram, to your social media channels. Maybe you want to drive email signups. Maybe you want to sell product. Maybe you want to book consulting calls. Um, maybe you want to get engagement on a certain post. Maybe you're looking for reviews. I mean, the, the possibilities are endless. And for every micro influencer campaign you work, you, you kind of coordinate or collaborate or, or work on, those goals can probably change and the way that you will measure success can change. Um, so for one, if you're just trying to, to reach a brand new audience that you've never gotten in front of, maybe for you, it's just kind of getting some new followers on a social media account just so you can kind of start that relationship with that group or audience. Uh, maybe it's, again, book sales. So maybe you have a book launch coming out and this is part of your launch campaign and you just want to see those numbers on that sales sheet. And that's fine, too. Um, and again, maybe if you offer a, a service, you want to book consulting calls, maybe you're selling a course and you want to drive registrations for your course. So it can be, a, you know, it really can run the gamut on whatever you are trying to do to grow your business, finding a campaign that can align with that. But of course, it's very important to know, you know, what that's going to look like going into it. So again, I'll give you some examples of me at, at, at Lulu starting out with working with micro influencers and really just being excited that they were that they wanted to do it. And so having no nothing to measure or no real ask. And that was a mistake. Um, and even though I'm, I'm glad that we obviously did that because I was able to learn from it. But understanding what are you trying to get out of it and being sure that you communicate that with those expectations with the influencer and that you have a way to measure that or at the end of the day, when the campaign is run, when the posts are over, when they've run their course, you can say, yes, this was a success. So I want to invest in this again. Or you know what? This really didn't hit the metrics I was looking for. So I think I need to find someone maybe in a different niche or genre that I can work with. All right. Last but not least, and I will give you a real world example of this, but plan your, your CTA, which is a call to action. 
plan your call to action ahead of time and what metrics you will use to measure the campaign. So again, I'm kind of putting all my cards on the table and just kind of <laughs> using my failures to help you fail less. Um, but not knowing what your CTA is. So just being excited that someone is going to work with you or ch champion your brand or share your book and then just feeling like that's so great. So of course, if a million people see my product, that equals a million dollars in sales or that equals a million new followers on you know whatever social media platform. That is not the case. Just because people see that you are working with someone or that you sponsored a post, they're not gonna be motivated to do anything outside of read it. So be sure that as you're entering in, to these um, negotiations, this conversation, this relationship, you know exactly what you want them to ask their followers to do so that you can have that success at the end of the campaign. Oh, and how will you measure it? So again, if you are, um, you know, this is gonna change for every platform you may be working with. So social media, maybe you are just looking for likes, followers, engagement, you know, things like that. If you are sponsoring a podcast, you're probably gonna look at traffic to your website or purchases from your website or you know bookings with you to do whatever it is that you're wonderful at doing um if it's a um newsletter again maybe click through rates maybe um responses to the newsletter maybe um you know again bookings or traffic to whatever link you put in the newsletter things like that so you want to be really clear based on the different platform you're using what you're going to be looking for in regards to metrics. And I, I think I may have this on the next slide as well, but the majority of platforms that you work with or sponsor or um, collaborate with are going to have some sort of metrics they can give you. Um, so it doesn't have to be you all looking at your stuff. They should be able to provide some data, you know, on, on how the post performed as well. All right. So now we're going to talk about how to pitch to an influencer. So I also want to say that if you are, uh, this, this can kind of work both ways. So a lot of the information I'm giving you, if you find yourself with a couple thousand really highly engaged followers or subscribers or podcast listeners or what have you, then you've got something there. You've got something that you can now present to brands that you want to work with and say, hey, you know, I've got um, 7,000, 10,000, 15,000, whatever uh, followers, subscribers, listeners that really love what I'm doing. And I think that your brand is a good fit. So if you kind of want to be on the other side of this, you can do that as well and then go to brands and approach them. And the really important thing there is to have metrics. So personally, when, when people come to me and say, hey, would you like to sponsor fill in the blank? I want to see the numbers. I want to see um, how many uh, how much engagement you're getting, what your content is, how many subscribers you have, things like that. Have you had success success in the past with collaborations like this? But again, I also want to know that you know who my audience is before you reach out. So I think that's a two-way street, whether you are the one pitching to say, hey, will you share my information? Or you're the one saying, hey, I have this audience. Do you want to sponsor some content that I would be happy to run for you? You need to be sure that you understand who that audience is, because regardless of which side of it you're on, you're just wasting that other person's time if you're not really clear on who their audience is and the value that you can add. All right, so when you are pitching to a, an influencer, here are just some tips on how to craft your pitch, some things that you really want to include along the way. So be sure that the collaboration is appealing and simple. Keep it simple, smart person, as the saying goes. So you don't want to make them have to jump through a bunch of hoops and you know go on a trip or you know buy the book and then edit it for you or you know whatever. You want to make the barrier to entry really easy because at the end of the day, we all have other things going on, whether it be in our business, our personal lives, whatever. So you want it to be really easy for them to say, yes, I, I think this is worth my time and you made it so easy for me. I'm going to do it. So again, you want to be flexible on this, but maybe saying, hey, here's what this could look like here. You know, uh, a lot of times when I reach out to micro or macro influencers, I'll say, here's what we've done in the past. Um, you know, and I'll show some examples of that, of course, but giving them some information or kind of getting the creative juices flowing or saying, this has been really successful for us. This may work for your audience because I know what they're looking for and I'm seeing the kind of content you're putting out. So maybe doing a post like this could work. Running it for this amount of time might work for you. Doing it at this time frame might work. So any tips that you can give that will take the, the work workload off of them can make it more appealing. And whatever uh, kind of, again, barriers to entry you can remove to get them to saying yes is going to be obviously in your favor. So let them know what compensation you are willing to offer and if it's negotiable. So 
I put the negotiable thing on here. Again, this is kind of up to you, depending on who you're working with, if you kind of want to put on your cards on the table. But really what I wanted you to think about there is, again, knowing your budget, knowing, hey, I can afford to give you X amount of dollars, or I can afford to give you a free coaching, a free um, seat in one of my online courses, a free ticket to this event that I want you to promote, a free, you know, uh, whatever, whatever it is, free access to fill in the blank or, you know, free books, et cetera. But you have to know what you're comfortable providing and what is going to make it worth it for you. And also, you know, you want to leave some room for negotiation, of course. And I said, let them know if, if it's negotiable. But really, I just want you to know if it's negotiable because you don't want to get in a situation where for whatever reason you decided, hey, my budget is 500, but this person wants a thousand. So I'm just going to go for it. And then you're sitting like, you know, brooding in the corner, brooding, brooding. Oh, I said that word wrong, whichever it is correct it in your mind, but angry in the corner because you overspent your budget and you didn't want to, but you felt like this person was going to be a good fit and they weren't. So make sure you understand what you're comfortable spending, what you're, what you're comfortable giving for this opportunity. And then if it is someone that you feel because you've done your research is very aligned with your brand and you know for a fact that all their audience is going to love, love, love what you're doing and the content you have to share then you can maybe say, hey, you know, my budget is up to this. Or, you know, maybe they come back with another number and you can start that conversation, but just kind of know going into it what you're comfortable spending and have that clear in your mind so you don't feel like you've been fleeced at the end of the campaign. All right, another important thing is know your time frame for the campaign. So, you know, if it's time sensitive, you need to communicate that right up front and say, hey, I've got a book launch coming up in, in you know, a month, in a couple of weeks. I really would love to have these posts um, correspond with that launch. I think that, that would be really helpful. So if you're wanting to, uh, if you are thinking that you want this person to review your book, that's going to take some time. And you need to be aware and considerate of their timetable as well. A lot of folks who work with sponsors or organizations or individuals regularly may have their sponsorship calendar or their ad run planned out a couple months in advance. So, you know, you don't want to be pushy and say, hey, I need you to do this today because my book is coming out tomorrow. So, hey, thanks so much. You want to be able to reach out to them and say, hey, here's what I'm looking for. Here's a time frame that I would love to see this executed. Is this doable? You want to have these conversations in the beginning so that, again, you don't get too far down the road and then it doesn't work or the timing isn't right or they didn't understand that you were on a timeline and then it just kind of, you know, negates all the hard work that you did. All right. So you also uh, want to choose how you will measure success and what analytics you will request from the influencer. So if you're working with someone who has done a couple of these before, then they will understand that they it's that they need to or should provide some sort of analytics for the post. So um, depending on the platform, most platforms are going to give you, you know, some analytics are going to be built into it. There's some things that you're going to be able to see on your end, such as sales or UTM, um, which is just a, a link you can provide that will give you tracking for a specific campaign. So there are things on your end that you can see, obviously, and there are things on their end that they can see. So how many people engaged with this post? How many DMs did they get asking for more information? How many people liked it? How many people shared it? So things like that, they should be able to be, provide to you. And so it's up to you to have this conversation in the beginning and say, hey, for this campaign, you know, I really want to see how engaging it is. I want to see how my language uh, worked with your audience. Did they did a lot of people click on it? Did a lot of people watch the video? Did a lot of people link out to my website? Whatever it is. So choose how you want to measure success um, and what you will request from the influencers. So, again, most people will say to you, I will give you post analytics when it's we're on its course. But if, if not, just be prepared to say, hey, can you show me, you know, who liked, who subscribed, who who clicked to my site, who, you know, how many engagements did you get on this post, whatever that looks like for you. And this last one I put on here, and I mean, best practice will tell you to, to have a contract, of course, to protect you and the person you're working with. But to be honest, sometimes that doesn't always feel appropriate. I mean, if you approach someone who has you know, a couple thousand followers and maybe you know them or maybe you were one of those followers and, you know, it's a good faith situation and you feel confident in that, then maybe just saying, hey, here's the deal and you trust them, then maybe that can work out too. So I, I put this in there because again, you know, it is best practice. Um, we are a very litigious society, so it's not a bad idea to have in writing the agreements, especially, um, you know, because you have something to reference if it includes deliverables and time frame. 
you know, again, if it's a, a big investment for you or an investment of any kind, then it's not a bad idea to just say, hey, all right, this is what we've agreed on. Have both parties sign it so you can go back to the contract. And this isn't just a worst case scenario kind of situation, but it, it again, protects you both, right? So, you know, if the, if the person you're working with says, hey, um, I chose six winners for this giveaway, and you say, hey, well, you know, in the contract, we said five, that I'll provide five, then, you know, that's a, a point blank, black and white, we agreed on this, you signed it, I signed it, this is what I'm, I'm willing to provide. So it can help you. Um, and it can also help them if you kind of get a little bit excited, I would say, and say, oh, this, this really went well, let's run it another day, or let's do this again. And they say, hey, well, you know, thank you, we can have that conversation. But for this ad, um, or for this sponsorship, we said it was going to run three days and that I was going to do two posts. So again, and regardless of if you're um, here today to learn how to work with micro influencers, or if you are here today to pitch to, or to become an influencer yourself, these are good opportunities for you to, to just think about when you're on, again, either end of that conversation. All right. So this is shifting gears a little bit, but if you are the one who is pitching, who is selling, um, who wants to get your books out there, well, uh, there are a couple ways you can do that. So of course, regardless of what you're selling, you want to maximize your sales options. I'll put on my put it back on my Lulu hat if I ever took it off to talk about these really quickly. So for Lulu, we have three options to sell your book. So if you are selling your book and that is what you're approaching a micro influencer for because you want reviews or book sales, you want to make sure you have somewhere to send these folks. So where are they going to go to buy your book? So make sure that you've got your links, that you've got the back end set up, that you're ready to take on all these orders, this influx of orders that you'll be getting from working with this influencer. So of course, first up, you can work uh, sell your books through the Lulu bookstore. Lulu accounts are free. You can make one today if you haven't already. Upload your book. And then once you get your proof copy, again, all of this information is for naught if you have not done your job in, in offering a really good product or service. So here we're talking about books. If Lulu makes your books, you're good. We make beautiful books. I, I saw this one person in the chat, Roy, said he loved Lulu. Thank you so much. So there's at least one person who thinks we make good books <laughs> on the call today. All right. So you want to make sure that your book is good. Once the proof copy is approved and it looks wonderful, then you can sell it through the Lulu bookstore. We have an 80-20 revenue split there. So you keep 80% of the revenue. Lulu gets 20 you can also go through global distribution. So if you are hoping to um, sell your book, you know, through uh, Amazon, Ingram, or Barnes & Noble, our global distribution option is fantastic for you. So you upload your book, approve the proof, and then you can send it through those channels. So again, when I talk about getting your ducks in a row before reaching out to these influencers, if you want to go through global distribution on Lulu, it'll take about four to six weeks for your title to be live on Amazon, on Ingram, on, Bar on Barnes & Noble. So just another thing to be aware of when you're kind of planning out that timeline. Last but absolutely not least, sell on your own website. So I would recommend highly that if you are um, working with an influencer campaign, you will have a way to sell your books directly. So even if you post, you work with someone who does a great post for you on social media and you have a ton of traffic to buy your book, if you are not selling through your own website, you can't get those email addresses. You can't see who bought your book um, and you're not going to make as much per sale. So with Lulu Direct, you can sell through your own website. We have an integration with Shopify as well as WooCommerce. The, our, into, our apps for those platforms are free. So you upload your book, sell it through your own website. You're able to keep 100% of your revenue. You get transactional data so you can grow your email list and start owning that audience, which is so important. You can white label the service so your brand is front and center. No one has to know that Lulu is a part of the process if you don't want them to. Um, and uh, you can automate the print and fulfillment. So this is a completed, completely automated solution. You just plug into our, our apps, start selling your book. As orders come through, they're sent to Lulu to print and fulfill. Completely automated. You never have to worry about guesstimating how much stock you need um, or how many you should keep on hand. So a really great way to couple your micro influencer campaign with direct sales and create something really, really powerful. All right, so now as I promised, I'm gonna talk about some micro influencer campaigns that we have done um, to kind of show you what worked, what didn't and help you on your journey. I'm wondering how much longer I can use this image, but it's just so great. I, I mean, the tiger, Joe Exotic in the wild, I just, I'll probably keep it infinite, infinitely. Okay, so 
I talked about things that I would have done differently. <laughs> Hindsight is 2020. So Tika the Iggy, if you are a fan of fashionable canines, look no further than this dog. This dog's been on the Drew Barrymore show. Uh, I was looking at a People magazine about a year ago and saw this, this dog. So Tika the Iggy is a beautiful Italian greyhound um, that wears clothes that will put you all to shame. Her wardrobe is unrivaled. It is exquisite. So Tika the Iggy works with Lulu. Uh, they make calendars through us. They've also done a children's book through us. Um, they also sell direct. So they're really kind of doing all the things. They're nailing it. So as you can see, Tika has over a million followers on Instagram. Um, incredibly popular Instagram account. They do photos of this dog in, in beautiful locations and beautiful clothing. It's a great niche. Uh, and they did a calendar with us. So I was really excited to see um, that someone with such a large following was using us. I, saw, I thought it would be a great opportunity to collaborate with them. So I reached out in 2021. I believe this was in November or December and said, hey, we would love to do a giveaway with you. So at that point, I kind of saw that they were doing sponsored posts regularly. So I felt like since they were already working with us, this would be a good um, collaboration. I thought a giveaway would be great because their audience is so engaged and loves this dog so much. So I knew that they would be thrilled to get a calendar. So when I reached out to them, I just said, I would be willing to give you, you know, five free calendars. Let's collaborate. This will be great. So they were excited. They said, yes, they wanted to do it. So on their post, they said, comment with your favorite part of 2021 or what you're looking forward to in 2022. So as you can see, I just took a little screenshot of the post from their Instagram. It got 88,000 likes. That is a lot of likes. It got 1,700 um, responses or, or entries to it. And you'll see here, we gained eight Instagram followers from this collaboration. <laughs> so I could not see like the, the trees for the forest, if you will, or the four. I, I only saw the forest. I didn't really see the trees or again, <laughs> not really nailing my examples today, but I, I essentially just got so excited that they had such a large following. I did not ask for anything. I, I, I was kind of too nervous once they started communicating and they're so, they're so nice. The, the, these guys, Tika's dads are like the nicest people ever. So, but I was kind of nervous. I didn't want to um, ask too much and then have them say, no, we're not interested or, you know, it not work out. So what I learned from this was you have to have a CTA. You have to go into it knowing what you are looking to get out of it. Because honestly, when I did this, this is one of the very first ones we did. And I was just so excited. And in my mind, I was like, a million people are going to see this. Like, of course, I, I can't even, <laughs> I better tell our accounting department to get ready because we're going to have a flood of new authors and new customers. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that this post did drive people to buy the, the uh, calendar and look at it. Maybe even some created Lulu accounts. But what I really wanted was to grow our social following. And that wasn't really a success. I mean, we'll take eight new followers. That's great. It's definitely more than nothing. But when you look at these numbers and these metrics, I missed an opportunity here. So I wanted to start with this example because, again, this is a macro influencer. They have over a million followers. This dog <laughs> is, is, you know, pictured with celebrities all the time, has beautiful clothing. It's getting sponsored out the wazoo. And so this is an example of working with someone and getting exposure from someone. And because I didn't really know what to ask for and what I was looking for, I sort of missed the opportunity. So I wanted to start with this one as an example of working with a macro influencer and how quantity doesn't always result in high ROI for you and your brand. All right, so micro influencer example. So this is K.A. Knight. So K.A. Knight, um, is an author that works with us. She writes a lot of erotica uh, and romance and things like that. Um, so she has a very, very engaged audience. So you can see here, she's right in that micro influencer level. So 16,000 followers. So you may think about this and think, oh, well, you know, that's not, that's certainly not a million like Tika the Iggy. But for our giveaway we did with Kate, with Katie, with K.A. Knight, she said, comment with your favorite quote and follow Lulu's Instagram to enter. So you can see I'm getting a bit better with these as we go along, a bit more savvy on this one. I knew what to ask. I knew what our ask was. So we said, well, we'll do a giveaway with you. So she's decided that her, to enter, you had to comment with your favorite quote, which is really fun for her audience. They love that. They got a kick out of that. Um, and then follow us on Instagram to enter. So you can see the metrics, uh, 2,400 likes, 428 entries. 
From this giveaway, we gained 397 new followers on our Instagram. So this is checking all the boxes. Her audience is highly engaged. They love her. They love her books. They engage with all of her posts. They want to be involved. They built a community. People are going in there and commenting and starting conversations. Anything that she says or um, offers, is they are going to trust that and be excited in that. She poses questions all the time to our audience. I mean, it's just a, such an engaged audience that love the work that she's doing. She's done a fantastic job to curate this. And so doing this collaboration just made so much sense for us because, of course, we want to support all of our authors. And that's kind of where this started is wanting to support them, give them something fun to do with their audience. But also, these people wanted these books. So it was a win-win, right? So we got some exposure. We obviously netted, you know, a couple hundred followers in a very short time, which is very exciting. And then we were able to give her books to give away. So it really checked all the boxes for, um, for what you want a collaboration to look like. So very exciting for us to see this work out the way that it did. All right, so my last example is of a newsletter. So I wanted to share this example because there are gonna be opportunities for you to maybe find a macro influencer, but maybe they have micro opportunities. So what I mean by that is you can see here, I've got Colin and Samir. So this is a YouTube channel with, as you can see, just under a million followers. So quite a healthy following that they have built. So they also have a newsletter called Publish Press. So Publish Press was really a, a sweet spot for us because it has about 30,000 subscribers that they have on their email list right now. So one other thing I want to note about uh, newsletters, newsletters are such a great way for you to get your content out there because most people will read the entirety of a newsletter. Whereas if you do a post on social media, I mean, we all know the, the infinite scroll, doom scrolling, whatever. Um, you know, you're going through that pretty fast, depending on what you're doing. If you just need a break, if you're just looking at it for a second. So there's no guarantee, even if you do find a social media account that really aligns with what you're trying to share, there's no guarantee this posts are going to be seen or interacted with or engaged with. However, when you get into people's inbox, that kind of ups the ante a little bit. So personally, I subscribe to a ton of newsletters and I subscribe to them very specifically because I like reading through all the content. So you know, I'm not doing this willy nilly just for something to look at. If you subscribe to a newsletter, it's really more of a hassle to open it if you don't care about the content. So the folks that subscribe to these newsletters are more highly engaged already inherently. So newsletters are a great way for you to get your content in front of people. So we saw Colin and Samir, they have a huge following. So again, this is that macro influencer level for their YouTube channel, which may not be right for us. You know, I don't think our content would, um, really makes sense for a YouTube ad in, in their case based on the content they put out. However, their newsletter is a different story. So you can see here, it's where creators get their news. So we are trying to reach folks who are content creators who have content that will translate really nicely into a book. This felt like a really good uh, alignment for us. So we went in with a sponsorship. You can see here that this is the newsletter. This is the ad that we ran. And we did something different here. So you can see for the uh, two social media campaigns that we did, we were asking for, well, one, we didn't ask for anything. The second one, we asked for subscribers. And this one, we did something different and we offered free consulting calls. So we understood with this audience, who this audience was. We didn't want them to just be sent to the homepage and say, hey, create an account and publish your book. We really wanted to have a hands-on experience with these creators to help them walk through the process and understand how they can turn their content into a high performing book to help for their brand. So as I said, they have 30,000 subscribers for this newsletter. We were in two ads with a different CTA than we had done in the past. So we have seven leads so far. So you may look at that and think, gosh, 30,000 subscribers, you only have seven leads. That's what is, that's not good. Whatever that percentage is, it's quite low. <laughs> but, but when you look at who these people are, these are highly, highly qualified candidates. These are exactly the people that we wanted to be talking to. So even though we've only gotten seven calls booked so far, we've already have, have had conversations with several of them. And these creators combined, when I look at the social media accounts that these seven folks have built, the communities that they built up, we we're able to reach over a million people when we do this right. So when we work with them, when we help them really interact with Lulu and really get through the process successfully, they will be become, you know, macro and micro influencers of ours on their own. They will be telling their audiences to buy their own books. 
So all these people are working on print projects right now, different books, whether it be cookbooks or devotionals or, you know, I spoke yesterday with a guy who works with content creators in Spain. So he's going to be driving all of those people to Lulu to print and publish their books. So even though when you see seven of 30,000, that seems like not great. It doesn't seem like a success. But when we look into the metrics and we knew what was really important to us was getting a few highly qualified candidates who have larger audiences that we can help them reach through helping them publish and print their books. So this is a really good example of really being clear on what success looks like for you, trying a CTA, trying something new, and finding a, a, a group that has a trusted audience, a very large audience, but looking for other opportunities in their ecosystem to see how can you get to a smaller slice of that really highly engaged, um, targeted audience that we were looking for. So again, this one checks all the boxes and we were really excited to see how that worked out. Woo, all right, we're coming to the end of it. So a couple of free sources for you if you are in interested. So we have our Lulu blog. As I mentioned, I did base this presentation off of a blog. So if you did want a bit more information or just kind of wanted to see what we included there, then please go to blog.lulu.com. It's the same title, how to reach how to reach a wider audience by, by working with influ micro influencers. You'll see it. You'll see it. So um, check that out if you'd like. Our blog's great. We update it regularly. Help Center, if you do need help, help.lulu.com, or you can find our support tab on any of our pages of our website if you do need to reach out for support. Lulu University. So Lulu University is our educational channel. Uh, we do tutorials, how-to videos on there. We also upload our webinars to our YouTube channel. So please go like and subscribe if you have not already. We would very much appreciate that. And you'll be getting served up free, wonderful, hot, fresh content from the Lulu team. All right. So I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, I see that there are some in the Q&A tab that I will hop over to. Uh, I see that Pascal had asked, uh, does Lulu offer pre-sale? We do not yet. So you can't do that through Lulu.com. However, if you do use Lulu Direct or you know our WooCommerce or Shopify integrations or our print API, you can control that mechanism and you can take orders and then fulfill them when your book launches. So if you just are selling through the Lulu.com website, we don't do pre-orders. However, there are mechanisms where you can do that using our automation and fulfillment as the back end. It's a great question to get it started. All right, so let's see. Saad is saying on selling, can you not have both options of second through Lulu or direct? So I think that you are referring, and obviously correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I think that you are um, referring to um, the slide that I have with our sales options. So you can do it all. You can sell every which way with Lulu. So you can have your book on the Lulu website, you can have it through global distribution, and you can also sell it on your website. And we always recommend to folks to do all of them. I mean, your, your books need to be where your readers are. So you are going to want to make your book available in as many places as possible. So you can absolutely work with all of these or pick and choose what's going to make the most sense for you. So yes, you can. All right, David. Hey, David. So David's saying thanks for the examples. Um, it would be great if we had a list of, say, three to five micro influencers per genre. That would be great, wouldn't it? That's a lot of genres to span. So James is kind of asking something similar. How do I find influencers? So this is going to be so based on your own research into your audience. So I had to do a lot of research to find these folks that we wanted to pair with for, for our campaigns. But, uh, you know, for what I'm researching now is the creator economy. So creative entrepreneurs, content creators, where are these people? Where do they go to find their information? I subscribe to so many newsletters to see hey, is this information in line with what we're trying to share? Does this audience come to this newsletter to learn how to make passive income, to learn how to publish a book, to learn how to reach new audiences? Any of those things I'm looking for to monetize their content, that, that's exactly what I'm looking for. So your search really starts with knowing your audience and who you're trying to get in front of. So, I mean, how do you find influencers? Google them. You know, look for, if your book is about, um, I don't know, how to, how to make the best cup of coffee ever, where do coffee lovers hang out? Where are they going to find the coolest gadgets in their new espresso maker or cold cold press, press, hot press, what, French press, that's it. So, so wherever these people are going to find that, you want to align yourself with those brands, with those outlets, with those organizations and see if you can do a collaboration. So there's not an easy answer for how do I find influencers? The answer is find out who your target audience is and then let them lead you to 
the people that they're getting their information from, that is your influencer and that is who you're going to want to work with. All right, let's see. Okay, I'm going to do a last call for questions to see if you guys have anything. So as I mentioned, you know, you uh, you, you will get a, a copy of this recording through the email that you use to register for the webinar today. It will also be posted on our YouTube channel within about 24 hours. So my best advice to you to find your influencers is know your audience. I, I say that ad nauseum, but it's because it's so true. If you kind of just go to Google and say, who are the top influencers? You're going to get Mr. Beast. He has 100 million followers on YouTube. The chances of you getting in touch with him and for the campaign to be successful, those are pretty slim. I mean, I, I started with the example of working with an, a million follower account. We got eight Instagram followers from that. By working with someone with a 16,000 follower account, we netted almost 400 followers from that. So you really want to be thinking about who is in line with your audience and who is in line with your content and how can you connect with them. All right. Um, what if you know or think you do? Mine is a beach book right now. So if you think that you do, that's a that's a perfect way to start. So beach reads, where are people going? I mean, there are whole websites devoted to finding your beach read. Reach out to them. See what communities they're on. Do they have an email list? Do they have a newsletter? Can you collaborate? How can you get on their list? Um, so that's a great place to start. I think that you do know. If you think you know, you probably do. So start looking for that. Go to Google. Where are people looking for beach reads? What do people want to read on the beach? How are they finding it? What book list can you what book list can you be involved in? I would bet you that there is a social media account that is just dedicated to reviewing beach reads. Go out there and find it. I, I'm guessing that there is. I know you can find it. And good luck. All right. So Kirian is saying, I write educational books. My audience are teachers, schools, parents, and homeschoolers. Where do I start? Really hard to find legit influencers. I don't want to invalidate you, your comment on it's really hard to find influencers, but I will say for Lulu Jr., that is our audience too. That is exactly our audience. We want to talk to teachers. We want to te talk to parents, specifically homeschoolers as well. There are so many mommy blogs and so many channels where moms, where homeschoolers are getting in front of people and saying, hey, I found this great list of resources. I read this great book. Here, here's what you can use to help your curriculum. Here's how you can stay organized. Google any of those things homeschoolers, parents of young children, um, teacher forums. I mean, Facebook groups are a great place for that as well. So looking at these Facebook groups, joining them and just starting the conversation. So you don't have to start it as, you know, with your advertiser hat on. You can kind of just join these groups, see what they're talking about. And you'll probably hear, you know, just being a fly on the wall, say, oh, you know, I read in this newsletter or I, I did you guys see, you know, this social media influencer's latest video? I love their tips. Also look at, accounts and who they're following. So, you know, if you see a teacher who is posting a lot of content on homeschooling or uh, or on, you know, how they're getting ready for the school year, who are they following? That could be a great way for you to find good, uh, good audiences or good influencers. And the same for every single one of those. So if you're seeing a lot of parents online, what groups are they involved in? Um, what newsletters do they subscribe to? So each one of those can give you a plethora of opportunities. And, you know, I know that can be difficult to find qualified influencers and have these conversations. But if you do your research and you've done your work in advance to, again, make the pitch appealing to them, understand your budget, understand your ask, it is it's definitely doable. So good luck to you, Carrie Ann, and thank you for asking that question. Um, all right. When, so James is saying when you do a Google search, you use micro influencer title or something else. So when I look for... You're going to want to play around with keywords for sure. So when I'm looking for right now, as I said, you know, creators. So how can I get in front of the creator economy? So what I'm searching for are best YouTube channels for creatives, best YouTube channels for content creators, where best communities for creative entrepreneurs. So I am using every configuration of these keywords. I know content and I know creator are, are what I'm looking for. But some people call themselves creatives. Some people call themselves content entrepreneurs. Um, the creator economy is another another thing that you can look for. So, or that I would look for. So, if you know, you know what you're looking for, you want to, um, you really want to be playing around with all those keywords to see what will come up. Because, I mean, this may take an afternoon. It may take, you know, several days. It could take a week for you to find this person. But if you've done your due diligence and you find the right qualified candidates, it can be so, so worth it. So, I mean, I wouldn't, I would not Google just micro influencers. That's not going to be helpful. 
what you need to do is get really niche in what you're looking for exactly. So again, I'll go back to the, the beach read, um, the yeah beach or, or waiting room read. So for that, if I was looking for an influencer for that, I would say beach reads, you know, beach read websites, social media accounts that review beach books, um, summer reading lists, easy summer reads, books to take to the beach. So just playing around with these keywords until you're finding the websites that are going to list those books, the social media accounts, you know, top 10 beach reads that I came across this year, things like that. And then you can continue to narrow it down until you find something really approachable that's going to work. All right. Um, thank you, John, Chris, and Carrie Ann. All right. So what is the best site to find book reviewers with 1,000 to 5,000 followers? I don't know. You can Google it. I, you know, I... I know that there are, there are certainly websites. I mean, I get emails all the time from websites that are like, hey, find your perfect influencer. I don't think that that's the right way to do it. I, I again, would really start on the level of you understanding your audience and letting them lead you to the influencer rather than just Googling influencers with 5,000 that have 5,000 followers and going that route. Because I feel like it's a much more genuine connection when you follow your audience to the influencers they follow. Um, but, you know, everything, you know, who am I to say, you know, I'm, I'm working on this too. We've been doing this for about a year now and we we're going to continue doing it because we have found a lot of success with it, but it's, it takes some time. And obviously there are going to be some that really pan out. There are going to be some that you realize this wasn't the right audience, but for us, I'm looking for who my audience is looking for and then getting in touch with that person. So not really the other way around. So that's, that's what's been successful for us. Um, and, and I think that that might work for you as well. But that being said, I'm sure if you type in, you know, bookstagram accounts, you know, then you're going to get a list uh, with varying ranges of audiences. And, and that could be a, a good starting point as well. All right. Um, what about micro micro influencers between 2000 8000? Do you feel these can be effective? Uh, yeah. Oh, 100 percent. Yes. Really what you're looking for here. I mean, the numbers. I really wouldn't get hung up on the numbers. I mean, Google told me that a micro influencer is 10 to 50,000. But that what you're really looking for is the engagement, right? You're looking for a community that trusts this person and is highly engaged with their content. There are YouTube accounts that have a thousand subscribers and those posts are getting, you know, 50 comments, you know, hundreds of views or whatever. That may be perfect for you. So yeah, I mean, and if you are that person that has that many followers, yeah. If you know, if you have a highly engaged audience, because so for me, if people come to me, so if you came to me and said, hey, I've got an audience of 3,000 people. Would you like to sponsor some content on my channel? What I'm going to be looking for when I look at your page is how highly engaged is your audience? So if I come to your, you know, your platform and see only 3,000 followers, but every single post that you post has, you know, 100, 200 comments, uh, you know, 1,000 likes, 2,000 likes, and be like, wow, this person really knows exactly what this audience needs. They know how to communicate with them. They're trusted. Yeah, I would love to give you some money because you obviously know what you're doing. So just because you haven't cracked that double digit thousands, you know, tens of thousands mark doesn't mean that your audience isn't viable. It's all about the curation of content that you're putting in front of them and how they're engaging with it. So the engagement, I mean, I'll give you another real life example. I came across an author um, that has, you know, a couple hundred thousand followers on Instagram and I, I got excited about it. And I was like, oh, great. You know, maybe we can do a collab with this person. But I looked through their post. And all of their posts, they had no likes, no engagements, no comments on the post. So that was a huge red flag to me. So I'm like, you know, this seems like maybe they had been bought or these people aren't, you know, interested really in, in what this channel is saying and what this platform or the content they're putting out. So again, just another example of, of how that may look. Um, all right. Yeah. Easy, but form informative. <laughs> all right. Uh, when you know your genre and who follows the writers you like, what influencer who, who is the influencer, the president of the fan club? So the influencer is going to be who people are getting their information from. So that could be an Instagram account where they're looking for book reviews. That could be a TikTok account where they're looking for book reviews. It could be a newsletter that everyone is subscribed to. It could be a website that everyone is going to, to get updates about things. So um, it can change for every topic and every genre, but you're just kind of looking for the top of the pyramid, if you will. So um, if you notice all your followers is, are subscribed to a certain newsletter, whoever's sending out that newsletter is the influencer. If you notice that everyone is going to a certain website to get information, whoever runs that website is who you want to talk to. So whoever's kind of at the top of the, of the content curation or um, uh, dissemination, I would say. 
All right. Okay. I think I got through. Um, all right. Yeah. So I think Chris is trying to help out maybe Carrie Ann with the schools, uh, school influencers. I think I got all the questions. Uh, I have gone over a little bit today. Um, so I appreciate everyone for sticking around and um, hanging out with me. So again, thank you so much for joining me today. I so appreciate it. Um, if you want to stay in the loop with our webinars, there is an auto subscribe feature when you sign up and I can put you on to every single one. Um, of course, you can choose at your discretion if you would like to join us um, and keep an eye out. We also have a, a, a landing page called webinars.lulu.com, which will also keep you up to date with everything that we have going on webinar wise. Um, my email is cbennett at lulu.com. Feel free to send me an email with any questions you may have or anything you'd like to see in a future webinar series. Um, I think I threw my whole spiel. So I guess I'll, um, I guess I'll sign off. <laughs> Just a last reminder, you will get a recording of this webinar. It'll also be posted to our YouTube channel. Thank you so much, everybody. I am always so excited when anyone chooses to spend this time with me that you decided to take some time to learn about micro influencers with me today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope you all have a fantastic Wednesday, a wonderful rest of your week, and I will see you again next time. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.